Okay. Um, um, Forrest, um, we've heard here today that um, the last two days how important it is for all sorts of things, um, but really how much do we know about the, the evolution of the whole region? Um, we know a bit about the gene morphology and we've got some historical records, but apart from that, looking at the vegetation, the evolution and the development of the whole floodplain, we don't know very much about it at all. So we can use paleoecology to do this, and if you want to um, add to your historical record, whether it's, it's missing or going back even beyond the historical record, you can use some of these techniques. Um, so, um, and I decided to use a floodplain. Floodplains are not usually used in the, for these sorts of studies because they have fairly large catchments. Um, they're very disturbed, and most colonologists don't like um, disturbed catchments. But they do contain a really good archive of um, whole catchment processes, local conditions, and, and land use responses in them. So I decided to use this. Um, when you take cores out of these these sites, they you really rely on on the depositional processes or deposition rates at each site to get different time. So you might get different times for each place. You might get a different spatial resolution. So to take out fairly large, a, a reasonable number of cores from a site gives you a picture across the floodplain. So I'm quite happy to um, take young men out into the forest or out into the swamplands, <laughs> where they're all going to Skype to each other about how strong they are, which means that we're going to get the coring equipment further down into the sediments. <laughs> Unfortunately, this, one, this photo was taken on a student field trip. It didn't come and help me. <laughs> um, this is my language. I'm not just a paleoecologist, I'm a palynologist. I look at pollen. So I sit and, apart from going out and doing field work, I come back and sample the cores and time slices, remove all the sediments from the sediment and get left with some pollen and sit down and count it all. And from that I can reconstruct vegetation histories over quite long terms, look, time frames. And then you can start to look at what might have caused these changes. Was it climate? Was it humans? Was it a bit of both? What are the interactions going on? So, they're all rather beautiful by the way, they have, most of them have lovely um, sculpturing on them. One of the problems we have in Australia is that um, a lot of our pollen we can only get to family level or even genus level. Poaceae pollen is poaceae pollen and it's a shame that eucalyptus pollen is often just eucalyptus and we can't get it any further. Same with cyperaceae. So my main interest is um, in in um, so my main interest is in, in tracing the changes from the Aboriginal landscape um, across the that boundary European settlement boundary and looking at all the subsequent changes from that rapid settlement that were there um, and also looking at, at what floodplain plain processes have changed as a result of river management. So I can start to answer all these questions and I can actually start to look at how old is the farm choke because Keith told us about some laminated lake sediments that he saw when um, an irrigation channel was being maintained and we went up and sampled it so it was very good. I didn't, I didn't go and sample it. Okay. So, um, it's, it's been an important place. Humans have been here for about 30,000 years and the Aboriginal people managed creeks, they managed the wetlands, but they did all of that within the controls of climate. Europeans came along and said if we don't use it we've wasted it basically. Um, and we've grazed sheep, cattle, logged the place, built levees, dammed the rivers, built regulators and we've created all of these artificial um, water channels across the landscape. And we've, we've really basically tried to um, override climate and natural processes. 
we seem to think we can manage to do that. Okay, so the same graph as yesterday. I took several cores out of the forest. All the black ones I actually sampled, did contiguous sampling through them and analysed the sediment properties of them. Um, three of them I used for pollen, and the red one is from the Moira Marshes on the other side, which has given us that older record. And um, Tim Stone named this project Moira Marshes because the first person to describe um, the geomorphology of the area was a person called Harris in 1936, and he called it the Moira Marshes. Um, if you think this is going to be a simple, simple talk, it's um, not. It's going to be again a story of an ever-changing system that's quite sensitive to any changes that um, we do to it. Okay, if we look at the the um, what we call the Holocene, the last 10,000 years, although this really um, record only goes back to 4,000 years. Um, I can get this to work. I can never actually see it. <coughs> okay. Can't do it. This was a core site here where the little star is. And, uh, and the red circles I put on for something else, but they're all old lake beds. They're, the whole area, apart from being one large lake at some period of time, <coughs> there's been a large number of lakes through there. Um, and the Murray River comes down and breach, breach, it did breach the um, Lake Canyapella um, lunette at some stage and there's a lovely Yorta Yorta story about how that was done by the people because they got sick of a very large flood that was in the floodplain. So then the floodplain drained and it did allow conditions for then the evolution, evolutionary processes of the river channel to, to occur. Um, I'm not actually sure if if the bar much hope is a result of the um, Cadell fault, but it certainly made it turn. It's, it went up past the Edwards River, and it's also come down south as well. Um, so I, as part of this, we generate horrible diagrams, and this is a very simple one. We start these histograms from the bottom. We start interpreting them from the bottom because that's the oldest part of the sediments. And we interpret them up. So it goes from past to present. And usually zero at the top as, as the soil surface and, and present conditions. So on the far side, you can see the changes that occurred. And I, I really think that this, um, this record is as a record of the formation of the choke in the digitate delta. Um, Jim Bowler says this occurred at 9,000 years. Um, Tim Stone says it occurred at 500 years. It's just one event. Um, I'm, my version's a bit different and they're not here to criticise me, so... <laughs> <laughs> I think it took a bit longer than that. Um, so first of all, there are... Ooh, sorry. Um, I really can't see this when I do it. At the bottom, the grey sediments are just glade water clogged, water logged clays that you get on a floodplain, and there was no pollen in them. Um, then there were the laminated lake sediments that we had, and they just slowly graduated into swamp conditions. At the top of the swamp sediments, there were some very coarse gravels, and above that, there were some um, levee sediments and the levee sediments weren't sampled. The graph labelled MS is for magnetic susceptibility, and that measures the biogenic iron in surface soil, and, and we use it as a, um, a record of um, catchment erosion of surface soils. So you can see there that as it increases, we're really saying something's happening in the catchment and there's sediment coming down, and that increases at the same time as the, the sands in the, in the um, sediment are increasing. So there's some increased river activity happening over that time. Um, probably due to the, the Murray River levee being breached at Picnic Point, um, and, and then you've got more material coming down. Um, at some stage, there doesn't seem to be 
towards the top, there's a big dip in the bed load, there's a dip in the magnetic susceptibility, there's a dip in, in the riparian pollen, which I'll describe in a minute. And I've interpreted that as something's happened to this river channel for, for a period of time. It's not actually flowing down there or it's not flooding. There's something happened and then it's come back again. Um, the other indicator that there's more river water coming into this floodplain is I, I summed all the pollen um, that represent um, riparian tax, riparian vegetation, and some of it was subalpine riparian vegetation as well, and that's the riparian one, and that was actually showing me that the conditions were cooler than they are now. So this stuff should be up. The closest it is now to, to Barmer is about 200 river kilometres away. So up in Mount Buffalo somewhere. Okay. But at the same time, oh, I haven't this stuff. <laughs> at the same time, the, the, the regional, the riverine plains are getting more arid. So it was cooler, but that, that cooling came as an aridity on the floodplain, on, on the, out in the riverine plains. Um, this is charcoal particles. Um, the regional charcoal fires that I've got there, a lot of that charcoal was actually coming down um, with the sediments, so it, it's very difficult to say what the, the fire regime was like. The local fires or large charcoal particles um, were local, and people, as the swamp developed, the lake started to dry up, the swamp developed, people started to use this site. They were burning it, there was burnt cypress and seeds on it, so we're very lucky to find something like this. And at the same time, there was a big increase in Myrtaceae pollen. Um, that also happened when Europeans arrived and changed the fire regime and people described all the scrub that was that turned up. And I think that what really happened was not just one evulsion event. This is a very flat country and this is again Keith's photo that gave to me of um, Gulf Creek breaching the levee and all the small channels that are forming. And that's probably what happened um, along the Barma Choke until the digitate delta started to form and, and form a proper channel. Um, the bottom one is a cross section taken off a, a LIDAR image and across the lake. And you can see that um, the river is actually still flowing across the top of the lake. It hasn't really um, cut into the lake. So there's no way this could have been just one avulsion event. So, and I think this, this whole process um, probably took place over about the 2,000 years or even 3,000 years of the record um, until all those gravels appeared at the site. So it was a long process rather than one um, event. Okay, so if we go to my other sediments, sorry about this one. <laughs> it's been a long time <laughs> doing this. Just look at the different colours because what has happened here, this is the sediment particle size analysis forget the other um, vectors on it. And what's happened over time is that the sediments have all started to move in towards the centre there. The sediments within the forest have become much more homogeneous between across the sites. They're quite different. Um, things like pH have changed. Um, the the ero catchment erosion um, indicators have changed over time. And, and really since um, the Hume Dam came online, any relationships that there were between pH and sediment or erosion and sediment don't apply anymore. It's just become a bit chaotic. Um, I, I only looked at the pollen from three sites because it was a bit difficult to look at. So Hut Lake, Gower's Gate on the southern border, which is quite a sensitive site. Um, so along axis one, Reedy Lake and, and part of Gales Gate are quite similar. This again is a, um, an ordination, a DCA that I had yesterday. Um, Hutt Lake and Reedy Lake are in a similar position along axis two. So there, there are different things happening in their hydrology gradients again. Gales Gate has formed two um, populations really. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a bit more about that in a minute. Okay, um, wetlands, uh, the wetlands system has changed and this site seems to have become a bit wetter over time, especially since um, the 1940s. And I think that's probably due to um, 
summer flooding and it's just kept it a bit wetter. Um, what happened early on when the squatters came in, and I think um, because it was only seasonal um, grazing, we got a change in native species. And, and I actually looked at the different sorts of cyperaceae and they changed, the species are changing up the, up the column. We, we started to get a few weeds um, at closer settlement time, but the weeds really hit the forest after, after the Hume Dam came online and irrigation started to happen. Um, we'll forget that one. If we look at this DCA just for Gower's Gate um, and look at the, the length of the arrows represent the extent of the change at each, in each time and the direction of the change. So this tight little bundle here, where it's been reasonably dry, was, <coughs> was pre-1840. And then all of a sudden there's a big change. So you've got big fluctuating changes that occur all the way up to when the Hume Dam came online. And then you get all these very large fluctuations going up and down at the, that second axis. Um, and I think the next change that happened was here, which I think is Dartmouth Dam coming into light, onto line. And that has again caused another change. So if you're a manager and you're looking for baseline data, which, which part of this graph are you going to take as your baseline of, of condition that you're going to try and manage that, that becomes quite hard? And I think that you know anything that you do in this system um, is going to change the vegetation again. Um, this is Hut Lake, um, and this one's more eucalyptus clumps. I really use as an indicator that the eucalypts are really um, <coughs> on site, very close by. So there's not really very many trees growing on site until we get way up to about 1980 that I've sort of tried to work out. And you'll notice that all the time that I've got terrible um, dating problems on this course. Um, it took me a long time to realise that at 20 centimetres it wasn't 3,000 years ago. That was about 1890, I think. <laughs> so the, there's terrible problems with there, so I've used multi-proxy stuff as well. But that cohort of um, eucalypts has probably come up, I think it came up after the 1963 flood. Is that right? I think that's right. Around Hut Lake, the latest one, and that's what's showing up there. Um, the myriad film is also showing changes in, in hydrological conditions because that flowers profusely when it when it's um, as the water level drops and it, and um, the conditions become swampy and then it flowers profusely. And as an azalea up there is probably from the 1996 flood. I took these calls just after the 1996 flood, and there was a lot of azalea on the floodplain. So. Um, and they're showing, they're also showing um, nutrient impacts as well. Okay, so we, we can show that, um, give this long-term record of what goes on and, and what direction and what rate things are happening and how big the changes are in the system. And, and some of these, the, the floodplain sediments are giving us a catchment, a really regional catchment picture of what's going on um, and we can see what's happening with the local vegetation as well so and I've been able to pick up from weeds um, and from fire indicators and, and other things um, the, the impact that we've actually had on the floodplain vegetation um, the part that says the forest is less dense now I would really um, go in some places it's less dense now. In other places at Gower's Gate it was probably very similar to what it is now, but I have a suspicion that it was box forest early on and it was cut out and then at some stage it was um, a cohort of red gums that came up. Um, so yes, and, 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 the, and actually we've, I've been able to show the age of the Probably the formation of that digitate delta for the farmer choke and what age it, it may have developed over. And it makes it fairly young. It got down to the bottom end of that old lake only about 500 years ago. It's a fairly young, young channel. Okay. My, I suppose my take home message is 
that whatever you're going to do, you're going to change the vegetation <laughs> and the floodplain.